Welcome, everyone. It's Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder at Family Office Association. Inflation, what is it? Why is it bad? And how to fix it? Our special guest today is Nathan Lewis, the co-author of a recent book by that same great title that I'm going with as well. Uh, the co-authors, by the way, are Steve Forbes and Elizabeth Ames. Nathan, it's really great to have you on. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. I mean, you're very, very much an accomplished author. You've been very active in the world of the asset management industry, including as a macro analyst, institutional investor, uh, and very active in the world of hedge funds. I'm based in Greenwich, Connecticut, so hedge funds are a part of our lexicon here. Really excited to have you on. And man, talk about the timing of your book and about the subject. For those that may hear this like 10 years from now, I'll give you a little bit of context. We're very late May of 2000. 22 and things are not looking so good we're in really challenging times here why don't we start with the basics what is inflation well that's a good question what is it uh, what does the word mean and unfortunately we don't get to decide how people use words and it, it had the term has become sort of this vague stew pot of all kinds of different things that might affect prices broadly and uh Economists in the past have tried to kind of attach a more specific definition to it, and, and no one cares what they think. So we have to deal with what we have. And uh, so one of the things we, we did in the book is we want to say, want to kind of tease out some of the macroeconomic cause and effect uh, processes that are going on that sometimes get the label inflation. Because people just, in any time prices go up, oh, there's inflation in, I don't know, dog biscuits or something, right? <laughs> Housing in Florida. Uh, they just attach it to anything. So we wanted to really break down between uh, non-monetary factors. So this is all the supply and demand things that might send prices up or down in a broad way. And we have a lot of those these days. Uh, we have all these kind of supply chain type issues, which are really unusual uh, and persistent in a way that maybe it hasn't been around since World War II. I mean, just when is the last time in your lifetime that auto dealers had no merchandise on the lot for months at a time, right? It's a very strange situation today. And that is, and things like that are actually, just as you read in the newspaper, actually are driving up prices a, a lot. It probably accounts for more than half of the CPI readings that we see. And it's important to remember because you always get some wise guy economists say, oh, inflation is everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Well, not always. <laughs> uh, and then you have the monetary factors. Uh, which again, these are also real today. And this has nothing to do with supply and demand. This is no short, even the price is going up. There's no shortages of anything from the monetary standpoint. Uh, this is really just changes in the value of the currency. And there's something that economists have talked about since 19th century. They call it the money illusion. The money illusion, 19th century, World War I being when floating currencies kind of first became pretty, pretty common. Uh, they call it the money illusion. And the money illusion is the assumption that your money is stable in value as it should be uh, when it's really not. We have floating fiat currencies. The values go up and down all the time. And over the long term, their value of floating fiat currencies, including the US dollar, has been downward. So if you just think of it that way, when the value of a floating fiat currency falls by 50%, for example, the Mexican peso goes from 10 to the dollar to 20 to the dollar, it's real obvious. Uh, then prices are going to adjust in consequence of that, right? You would, if you just saw the Mexican peso go from 10 to 20, you would just expect prices in Mexico to double in peso terms, not immediately, but over a period of time. And that's, and it's real obvious when it happens to Mexico, we just say, you know, Mexicans. Uh, but when it happens to us, everyone gets confused. And there was a gigantic amount of confusion of this in the 1970s. Uh, I estimate it was pretty much strictly monetary. Uh, and I estimate the value of the dollar probably fell by 90% in those days, 10 to one decline. And people are all pulling their hair out about you know, oil shortages and stuff. So uh, non-monetary factors, supply and demand factors, we have those monetary factors. I think the very aggressive central bank response to COVID mm -hmm. led to a decline in currency values around the world. Uh, and we also have that. Those two things together are producing the highest CPI numbers since the early 80s. Right. And the CPI is basically, uh, how could I say this, maybe the government manipulation 
of what really is the true inflation rate. We'll get to some of that shortly. So that's really a convergence of a lot of factors there that are very much negative relative to inflation. We have interest rates, like you said, coming out of COVID, the challenges there. Uh, our government's printing money like crazy. We'll get to modern uh, monetary theory shortly. So maybe in reading your great book, by the way, and I highly recommend it, Inflation, What It Is, Why It's Bad and How to Fix It, you have one of the most cleanest definitions, one sentence, I'm going to look at it now. Inflation is the distortion of prices that occurs when money loses value. I mean, that's perfect. I mean, that really, exactly. That <laughs> of, course, of course, I think it's it perfect. <laughs> I think it's perfect, but it, it's worth highlighting why we felt we had to write a book about it, why we chose to, to focus on that. Because on the one hand, it's not very surprising. But on the other hand, you don't hear this necessarily very much. You always hear about typically supply-related things. You know, well, supply went up, currency went up, or, you know, some monetary measure went up 30%, and therefore there's inflation. Well, if you think about it, we have floating fiat currencies that go up and down for all kinds of reasons. Uh, yes, a, a dramatic increase in supply may result in a decline in the value. Mm -hmm. We had that. that. That did happen recently to us. Uh, but also, you can. It's not very hard to imagine very many situations where a currency might decline in value when there's really no change in supply. Some government guy says something, and the traders go, "I'm out of here," and the currency falls in value, well, maybe a lot. Um, so, if you think about it at, at, from the from the standpoint of a currency value, rather than kind of this mechanistic plum, you know, plumbing of more water going into the system kind of vision that a lot of people have. I think the situation becomes a lot clearer, a lot more easy to understand. I mean, this goes back, and you talk about it in your book, to the Bretton Woods Agreement back in the 40s, and then President Nixon in the early 70s making the decision uh, to not have the, the dollar backed by a physical asset that for hundreds of years seemed to work pretty good. Now, I'm going to go a little back and forth with you shortly on the subject, but I'm going to be positive on it now, and that was gold. Uh, so now... It's fiat money. It's backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the government. And I don't know, after multiple decades, if this is really working out so well. <laughs> I would say definitely not. Uh, not now. Yeah, <laughs> not now and, and not ever, really. If, if you, if, it's, if, it's important for all Americans to understand that we used to do different th things differently in this country. And in fact, all around the world, we used to do things differently. And if we first of all, we had a principle. The principle was money is stable in value and it's defined and it's regular and it doesn't change. The, the ideal was is like weights and measures, like a pound or, or an inch doesn't change, right? And that way you can use it functionally to measure things. Like you can measure the value of a stock or a value of an investment or you know, profit margin or something like that. Important. Um, and that was the idea behind money. And so there was a stable value principle. And the way you accomplish this in the real world is you link the value of the currency to gold. And we did this for hundreds and hundreds of years, actually thousands of years, and it worked very well. Uh, United States followed this principle just as all the other major countries did. And it became over, over it's for nearly two centuries, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And the last decade of that period, the 1960s was the most prosperous decade of the last century, basically. So there was no problem. But then we change things because the temptation to try to deal with one problem or another by some kind of monetary manipulation uh, has always been present. Uh, the first devaluations of debasement of currency dates back to the sixth century right. um, by governments. <laughs> uh, and it specifically is because Richard Nixon wanted to get reelected and he said, he'd said, well, let's just lower interest rates. And, and it worked. He did get reelected in 1972. Um, but now we have a floating fiat currency system. And a couple of interesting things about it. So we have central, instead of saying, oh, we, we're just going to link the value of the currency to something reliable like gold, we're going to have, uh, you know, some central banker guy just make stuff up as he goes along, right? They just make, obviously, I mean, has there any been any kind of systematized you know, response policy? No, they just make stuff up. And, um, and that's the situation we have now. And and it's never worked very well. Uh, I, I wrote a book of history about this, uh, Gold, the Final Standard, and you can look at similar experiments throughout the last 300 years, and it's never worked. Uh, 
the U.S. economy has never been as prosperous as it was in the 1960s, even though there are actually many advantages today. So not a very good system. And it might may, uh, you know, governments can kind of stumble along with this sort of thing for a long time, as we have. And but often they get into very serious situations. And if you look at the rise of monitor monetary theory type, you know, money printing ideologies these days, uh, I think it's not very, not very wholesome direction. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the having gold effectively back as opposed to fiat currency. A very broad question I would have and coming from total ignorance is I believe, I mean, maybe it's one, but I believe no country, no country on earth uses a precious metal. Usually that would be gold to back its currency. So the greater question is why? Is there a benefit to politicians or those in power to keep it that way? Uh, well, that's a good question. And I would point out that actually more than half of all the countries in the world, more than 100 countries, don't have floating fiat currencies. They link the value of the currency, official policy, to some external standard of value, typically the dollar or the euro, the dollar, dollar based, euro based. A gold standard system is the same basic idea. They had the same problems we have. They're locally homegrown central banker guys would create too many problems. And they said, forget about this guy. We're just going to link to the dollar. That's our policy. And we're not going to jiggle with the currency anymore. Um, so it's the same basic idea. And what, what, there are a couple of reasons why gold is not popular these days. One is um, there's actually to be a member of the IMF, which virtually all countries are today. You, it's actually explicitly, you cannot link your currency to gold. It's in there in the IMF agreement. <laughs> which is kind of explains things. The second is if you made some movements in that direction, you kind of become persona non grata in the international world because it became, you would present a major competitor for uh, a dollar, euro, and other major currencies, which are floating fiat currencies. Now, the, the recent example of this is uh, Qaddafi of Libya, who actually was proposing and, and going through with implementing a pan-African gold-based currency. And about 18 months later, he was no longer uh, in the lead and the leader of Libya. So sometimes they'll actually wheel the armies and the, and the bombers in to keep you maybe. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, there's a Hillary Clinton email that came out about that. So Hillary Clinton said, we don't really want this gold standard currency in Africa. And poof, Libya is no more. At least the old Libya. So, so the, it's not only an IMF agreement. There's there's kind of various pressures being put on there. Uh, but then, uh, but in a more practical sense, also, if you did have a um, gold standard based currency for a small country to get, let's let's just pick a country. Let's pick uh, Argentina. Well, maybe that's not a good example. Let's like, pick South Korea. If if South Korea had a gold based currency today, then obviously the exchange rate between the South Korean won and the US dollar would be the same as the dollar gold price, right? That's what that means. And because South Korea has a lot of trade, you know, South Korea is not a big country. They have to import a lot of things because they don't make them domestically. They have to export a lot of things because that's how you import things. And if you have a exchange rate, even if it's the exchange rate between, if we assume that gold is perfectly stable in value, it's not, but if we make that assumption, the exchange rate between dollars and gold is entirely the volatility of the dollar. But nevertheless, uh, that would produce a lot of difficulties for Korean trade and investment. And so they say, you know, we don't really want to get bombed by Libya. It's in the IMF agreements. And besides, you know, uh, being part of the dollar sphere is convenient. So that's kind of how, why it works out that way. Well, you bring up a lot there, and I guess I hinted at it in how I phrased the question and my audience is not surprised coming from me. So you're basically saying that central banks, the IMF, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, I mean, they're, they're more powerful than, I guess, any entity or person or president or prime minister on earth. So you're basically saying if a country that is part of that wanted, wanted to even go officially on something like a gold standard, they wouldn't be able to remain in the global financial economy. We're seeing the disruption now with the Russia-Ukraine war and what's happening to Russia. I mean, this does sound a little bit like the powers that be want the current system to continue. 
Uh, yes. Um, and now, now that, uh, you know, somewhat surprisingly, the we do are getting this kind of split between the West and the East, and enti caused entirely by the West. East is being friendly enough, but um, one of the results of that is they might just kind of pull out of the Western institutional arrangement, the IMF, you know, the World Bank, all this stuff, SWIFT system. They said, you know what, we're tired of you guys, and and that might free them to establishing a a gold block in along the Russia-China axis. And, and there are a lot of other friendly countries throughout Asia uh, and throughout Africa and the Middle East who are, are very gold friendly. They have long histories of using gold-based money just as we do. Uh, Han China was on the gold standard in the first century AD. Uh -huh. and the the, the uh, Arab dinar was the leading gold standard gold coin for 500 years, um, around, around 1000 AD. Um, so they have long traditions there, and they also don't like this dollar, fiat, BIS, IMF business either. Okay, let's let's dive a little bit into that, and maybe we'll go in some a different direction with our personal views on this one. When I think of it, I have a respect for gold. It's part of my portfolio. I understand it, and we know it has also a level of intrinsic value used in electronics, uh, and used in from our dental work, et cetera. But effectively, I mean, some people use the word rock, but more applicably, a metal. I guess it's defined as having value via its history as a store value, because we as the people globally, India, China, Switzerland, the US, deem it to have value. When you're describing kind of the perfect system I would think on the surface that you would actually be a fan of something that has limited supply, is maybe a little bit more modern and technical, and that leads me to Bitcoin. If you could talk a little bit, one, about my comment of gold and how Bitcoin could fit into this. The, the primary characteristic of gold is its stability of value, and that is what has made it uh, the premier monetary asset for literally for thousands of years. It has other nice features. It doesn't rot. You know, it doesn't tarnish. It, it's very persistent over time. It has very high value density. You know, there's all these other features. But if it didn't have that feature, it would not be useful as money. Um, and it, and it's apparently it still has that feature. Uh, so this, you know, if you want a, something that's very speculative, it's not very good because if it doesn't go up and down in value, it's not, you know, it's not very speculative, right? It, it really is today uh, as an investment asset. Uh, retains essentially the character of money. Um, it doesn't, ideal money. Uh, it doesn't go down, up and down in value. Doesn't make you any money, doesn't pay a dividend, doesn't loot, doesn't decline in a recession. Uh, and that's very different than Bitcoin. Bitcoin's defining characteristics is it's wild swings and unpredictable swings in value. And it doesn't matter what other Bitcoin characteristics there are. Uh, if it doesn't have that essential characteristic, it's useless as money. It might be useful, useful as a kind of like a, payment transfer device or something, but it can't serve as a numeraire as gold has for thousands of years. Now, certainly at scale over its very short lifespan, uh, effectively what, January of 2009, uh, pretty amazing in terms of, and I was of course a skeptic, like many people in my age bracket would be, and now my audience knows I'm broadly very active. Let's go with the word Web3 because it's far more than just Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And you know, maybe I'm a little bit down the rabbit hole and have uh, have gone a little too far one way or the other. That could be argued, but it does feel like going back to gold comparison to what the promise of Bitcoin could be, and has shown some promises being relatively very new. It does seems antiquated, uh, but maybe antiquated isn't so bad. Now let me change the direction a little bit. Is as the dollar. Now, we've been the dominant currency for about 70 or 80 years now. Historically, that usually means about the end of a cycle. I personally don't see the dollar just crapping out in the relatively short-term future, but it's probably inevitable. Are we going to have more, what do they call, like SDRs, where it's a basket that the IMF or others would recommend that might include the dollar, the yuan, the Swiss franc, gold, maybe even Bitcoin? Is that a future within five or 10 years that could be a reality? Uh, yeah, there are clearly plans along that way. And 
Um, they, you know, the, the IMF, it, it's kind of, it's kind of pitches this uh, scheme, this framework, but what does it really amount to? And I think it doesn't really amount to anything more than essentially a sort of global fiat currency. And it's not really based on anything. People say, oh, it's a basket of so-and-so and so. And if you kind of look at the details of the proposals, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and I think they're, they're just pitching out kind of fluffy words that get people to accept the idea of having a sort of untouchable global fiat currency that is beyond any political process, which is you know, pretty close to where central banks are today. But theoretically, you know, the, the Fed could uh, come under the influence of Congress and so forth. Uh, and also, I think to prevent, if you had the sort of global you know, unified system, uh, you wouldn't have any alternatives, right? You wouldn't be able to, say, it'd be harder to say that the dollar is rising or the euro is falling because it'd, it'd be harder to compare things. Um, so there's definitely plans along those lines. Uh, whether they will pan out, uh, I don't know. Uh, but and I, sh I should say about gold being so you know so-called antiquarian, they kind of people have these ideas of you know gold coins. Well, that really hasn't been the dominant paradigm since about 1720. <laughs> uh, during the gold standards era in the 1950s, 1960s, people didn't use gold coins. They had bank accounts just like we had to have today. Uh, credit cards were a little less common then, but same basic, they had them, same basic idea. And um, going forward, certainly you could have a uh, something that's you know very digital in character, uh, on, you know, based on a smartphone app, no banknotes, no coins, uh, that would still be based on gold. You know, ult ultimately, gold is a benchmark of value, and it may serve as a reserve asset uh, if you want it to, if you if that's part of your system. And if you think of it that way. How do we achieve our goal of stability of value? How do we have a currency that, that is operate or that has the features of something that is stable like a meter or a kilogram um, instead of something that value goes up and down because you know, Jay Powell got up on the wrong side of the bed. Um, and if you think of it that way, there's no real alternative to gold. There, there isn't even like a white paper. There isn't like some guys says, you know, I have this great idea that we can then prove wrong, right? There, there's not, not even a proposal. So really, you have no choice. It's, I mean, it may play into your point of view even more, but as you know, I may have the year a little off, 1933, FDR said every U.S. citizen uh, will pay you what they deem to be the fair market price, and they wanted the gold. I could use the word they confiscated, unless you wanted to get a felony, and you got, comp and you got compensated. Why don't we be a little more positive? Uh, now, again, I know that's a little off track to gold as a... Uh, backing the dollar, although maybe they would need a person's goal to help fulfill if that was the case, like back in 1933. How does that interplay to your thoughts? Well, in recent decades, we've had so many experiences with governments undermining the gold standard that we can forget that governments also create stable value systems. Uh, it, it has gone both ways. Uh, things don't always get worse. It's hard to imagine really any system, even a private system, even the you know, stable coin, whatever, that doesn't have government sanction. It doesn't have to be government run, but it should, you know, once they start applying money laundering laws and taxes and a thousand different ways to make it difficult to use, <laughs> it's going to be difficult to use, right? <laughs> it's not, well, you're going to have to have government effectively, sanction. it's a centralized system, which is what the governments want. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm not so sure that the NSA and the U.S. government didn't have a hand effectively in the creation of Bitcoin or don't control some of the exit nodes now. I'm not 100% sure that's not the case. But again, to those that may be hardcore libertarian or very protective of their rights, the whole thing about effectively in government control and then having it where we're not going to have paper money, we could see, feel, and touch, although backed really by nothing, but it's all going to be digital then it's all centralized. And suppose someone, a nefarious source, is controlling the digital entries. Suppose something really goes wrong and a presidential executive order says you cannot take money out of a bank. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but I can't say for sure 
that that never is going to happen. So these things, I think, concern people relative to governments, their control of money, their irresponsible spending, where we'll definitely be on the same side there when we talk a little bit more about the deficit. But the more that technology plays into it, I think in some ways, a little bit of the scarier the scenarios could get. Uh, yeah, we're clearly in a period, I, I agree, of, of, let's just say, deteriorating monetary governance <laughs> in, in many ways, whether it be restrictions on on you know moving your money around or what you can buy or a, a thousand different things, um, and we'll we'll see some uh, some uh, some alternatives pop up pop up to 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 deal with that. I think so. So uh, in terms of in terms of a, a gold something like a gold based stablecoin, it would have potentially, especially if it, if it was, it's hard to be completely decentralized like Bitcoin is because you basically have to have some gold somewhere. Our algorithmic stable coins turned out to be a failure, failed experiment. But if it was in some you know, fairly reliable jurisdiction, whatever that may be today, uh, you know, U USDT, USDT Tether, a USD -based, USD based stable coin, uh, has, a, you know, it has many of the characteristics of Bitcoin in, in the sense that you could get on a plane with nothing but your, you know, account numbers or whatever, and go to Paraguay and presumably access that store of value. Um, and it could just be based on gold instead of dollars, something like that. So we'll see how it works out. Uh, I think you were heading in that direction maybe a couple of minutes ago. I'm going to revisit it. And again, I hate to keep on revisiting kind of nefarious and things that could go wrong. But in doing consulting work for billion dollar families for a long time, their major thing is I'm already rich. Angelo, <laughs> tell me what could really, really go wrong. So my yes. mind tends to think a little bit in that direction. I thought you were trending to, and I think this is kind of what's going to happen when you were hinting at the IMF. Uh, the World Economic Forum, I mean, all things that are probably going to get me bad algorithms and in trouble for talking this way in a public forum like YouTube. We are trending, and I hinted at it with the electronic payments that I mentioned before, towards effectively central bank digital currencies. And then we know the drawback to that. First of all, wickedly efficient. Kudos to that. It It's impressive from that perspective. But government surveillance, lack of privacy. Anything I buy, anything I move around is monitored by some quote unquote government agency. And I guess if things were to really go wrong, they could flip the switch and maybe I don't have any access to my money. That sounds pretty scary to me. Uh, I agree. And, and I think this is clearly uh, an agenda. Um, it's not just people, you know, imagining things and they're moving forward on it pretty fast uh, there's you know even uh, yes. some places like like india has already gone semi-cashless right there's no more banknotes it's all digital and and just as you say uh, um it could get to the point where you go to the grocery store and they say well your bmi is kind of high so we're not going to let you buy those doritos well of course it could be a lot more sinister than that but that's the level of control that is actually being publicly discussed by these authorities. And um, it, it is, you know, in terms of, you know, preserving wealth and even preserving some modicum of liberty and freedom in this situation, that it's, it's hard to say what, what the best thing would be. But certainly uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. I agree with that. And we have to, you have to, at least in your mental space, get out in front of things a little bit because you don't be completely surprised. Uh Boy, this is going to get me in trouble, Nathan, but you know, nothing ever stops me before. You're probably better off giving a no comment or being very politically correct. But as you were phrasing what you just said, and I think what I was hinting at when I said central bank digital currencies, the powers that be, some of the global entities and organizations that we mentioned, and the lack of privacy that we'll have in something like a central bank digital currency, it does sound a little bit like what happened in the last two years with COVID and government restrictions and controls and controlling the minds of the populace of the population. And basically, for the most part, seeing how compliant, and I don't mean that in a positive way, how compliant a lot of people were. Uh, this sounds to me like we're setting the stage for really central bank digital currencies 
And it is what it is. You accept the fact that you're, this is all centralized. You're a part of the system. It's more of a global currency. And by the way, when I'm asked by billion dollar families how to hedge against some of this, I think for now in the short years to follow, we're pretty good. There are strategies you could do, but long-term, I don't think I have any answers for it. Yeah. I mean, it's clear there's nowhere to run right. uh, because it's, you know, all the, the top 50 major countries or whatever are, are in on it. And yes, um, although, although I, I would say uh, a couple things. Um, first of all, it's it's good to imagine alternatives, even though even if they seem remote. Um, if this is the way things are, how th should things be? And some of the you know some of the some of the alternatives in in a, in a in a zombie apocalypse is actually gold and silver coins themselves. They're made of metal. They're like they're not dependent on smartphones. They're not dependent on legal contracts. They're not dependent. You know, it's just a chunk of silver. And in fact, you can actually go and buy the the silver coins from the 1950s and early 1960s today. And I have several thousand dollars of those just because I can walk out of the street and they'll always be have some kind of value. And um, and and then you can kind of go on from there. I think I think there are are already some gold based stable coins out there. Tether itself actually has a gold uh, gold based offering. And obviously, if the dollar itself kind of goes and becomes confetti, then dollar based stable coin is not going to be very attractive. Or 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 if you have central bank digital currencies, which you know have accomplished the same thing at much lower overhead, uh, you're going to have to have some alternatives. And if it's not based on gold, what's it going to be based? You know, what's it going to be based on? Uh, just some guy, some guy, you know, crypto guy with a neck beard making stuff up, right? Hey, I don't know. what's wrong with a beard? <laughs> <laughs> well, yours is very well trained. I, you, know I mean, I, I, you know what I mean? Well, uh, I would add a little bit. And yeah, uh, physical ownership of gold in the way that you described is one of my recommendations. But that does have limitations, especially for whatever, a billion dollar quote unquote family with the portability. And if the world or the community knows that you have that much gold, you make yourself potentially a big target, just like you would being potentially cyber attacked. I get it with Bitcoin or crypto as well. So what I would also add to both of those as the mix would be, I'm giving away some of my secrets now, but diamonds, uh, specifically very high level color diamonds. But, and I actually have done an interview with Alan Bronstein, who's a world leader on that before. Uh, Let's go well, back. Let me, let me mention on, on gold and that if, if you have, it's nice to have something, you know, around the house. Don't tell anybody about it, but have it somewhere nearby. But uh, for larger quantities, you know, uh, up above a million dollars or something like that, uh, you can get uh, private vaults or private vaults all over the country. You don't hear about them very much, but uh, you, they're just a vault. They're, you know, it's a safe and, and uh, not affiliated with the bank. Don't get anything that's bank affiliated, no safety deposit boxes. And they're pretty reliable and they are guaranteed uh, typically or insured in an extreme case. Yeah, I mean, you could talk about free port zones in Switzerland. I do have a little strategy that I don't want to go too public with on my platform now, but but you are, you're on the right track. Now, that also brings up the question with compliance and government controls like we saw on COVID, how are you going to have, suppose you can't access interstate lines in the US, let alone going to Switzerland, like in my example. Now, again, I could always paint a scenario where things get really, 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 really bad. And then really all you have is your local community for lack of a better word. And yes, I plan for that as well with these people. Uh, <laughs> let's let's bring too. it back to be a little bit more chummy and positive. Sure. Uh, so the, <laughs> the government CPI is and what would it be now, Nathan? Is it about what, 7.5, 8%? Yeah, it changes from month to month, but it's about 8% recently. So that's what they're telling us. Does that really factor everything in? And do those that are in poverty in things like certain basics in housing and in food, it may be greater than that. And here's the irony for the super rich. And I know no one feels sorry for them. I get it. For the super rich that are buying more assets that are increasing in value and buying art, we didn't even talk about art, uh, that are buying resources, uh, property in Malibu and the Hamptons and London, uh, their inflation and buying NFL football teams, their inflation rate is not no seven and a half to eight percent. It's a lot more. Mm. 
Yeah, uh, you know, the CPI, CPI doesn't really exist. It's not something that you can measure like the distance from the earth to the sun or something like that. It, it's, it's kind of an abstract concept to fill a certain sort of need, right? Uh, because obviously the, the weighting, what products or services you measure can change from all kinds of, for all kinds of reasons. And also things just don't, just don't stay the same over time, right? Uh, almost nothing in the economy, goods or services is the same as it was 10 years ago, whether, you know, that be a nursing care or, or uh, smartphones. Uh, so measuring the price of something over, over a period of time is just inherently flawed uh, notion. Even, even something as simple as corn is not the same, right? Uh, corn from the 1950s is very different than corn today. Um, so yeah, the CPI, uh, it, it's, it's kind of, it's important to remember that it's just sort of a statistical abstraction. And it's one that it constantly undergoes changes from the statistical agencies. And the, all these changes have a funny characteristic to them. Uh, every time they change things, which is all the time, it ends up showing a lower CPI than if they didn't change it. <laughs> uh, yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> and so, so it makes, makes, everyone, makes everyone look a lot better. <laughs> now, there are other factors uh, that I guess could play into inflation and some of the issues that we we're both talking about. Uh, there's a war, Russia and the Ukraine. Two thirds of the largest suppliers of wheat in the world, a commodity. Russia is certainly a big as an energy and oil producer. Uh, how does this play into inflation as you look at it here in the States and around the world? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that definitely falls into the supply and demand category. It's not a monetary thing, it's more, right? And um, those are obviously issues. Uh, and I, I think actually food prices are probably double from here and, and energy prices will probably go up at least 50% more um, in the next, let's say, 12 months. So obviously that would be a big deal. <laughs> I ask you about investment recommendations. You kind of just gave two right there. We'll get to that. But, but, but so let me, let me just finish that. Sure. Uh, so, so these things are, are, are real concerns. Um, but, the, but the real, a more interesting, a more kind of fundamental question, a more, which has more longer term consequences is what do we expect to happen to the currency? Because the currency has, really, has nothing directly to do with these things. And actually, the Federal Reserve has been pretty responsible over the last, let's say, 12 or 18 months. They know they overdid it in 2020. They know that we had kind of an inflationary burst. Uh, and they've kind of held the line that dollar is not obviously falling in value these days. And in fact, it's, other currencies are falling more. Yes. Uh, uh, so for right now, there's no, not obviously a increasing inflationary monetary trend, I would say. That's my interpretation. Uh, but then if you, if you look into, get a little longer time frame, three, five, 10 years out, I do think we are in a time, not just in the United States, but around the world, where all these things that um, you could even trace back to Bretton Woods, but particularly in the last 30 years or so of chronic deficits, chronic rising G debt to GDP levels uh, from entitlement spending programs around the world, Europe and elsewhere, you know, pension funds and all these, all these commitments, uh, which we've talked about for decades, uh, you know, someday it's going to be important. Well, that someday looks like it's getting pretty close. And I, and the question is, what is the political response? And certainly politically, um, you know, politically in the United States and around the world, it seems like they just waiting to print the money. They know kind of when they do that, they can't go back. And so they kind of, you know, don't, but that's, that's kind of the, the thing that the politicians are embracing, it looks like to me. Well, that does bring up the question. I think we're both going to be on the same side on this one. Uh, modern monetary theory. It's supposed to be so modern. It goes back <laughs> a lot, like many, 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 many decades ago. And really just to me leaves me scratching my head. And I'm trying to keep a straight face when I ask this question. Uh, and I really actually want to learn if there's an opposite point of view on it. Why not, if modern monetary theory is so great, why not just print money endlessly? Why don't we just give every citizen like half a million, a million dollars? Would that actually work? And I'm trying to keep a straight face here, Nathan. That's a good question, actually. Uh, I did actually read Stephanie Kelton's book in detail because I didn't want to just poo-poo it. Uh, 
of course, I did poo poo it, but I wanted to then read it and then poo poo it. <laughs> <laughs> and it had some interesting points in it. And um, I agree. First of all, first of all, you can't just say don't print money because the money has to come from somewhere. Someone has to make it. And generally, an expanding economy needs more money. And the central bank's job is to create enough money, but not too much. That's basically what it is. And it's been that way since 1913 for the Fed. Um, so, the, and it, within this, um, there has been something that has not been discussed very much, but I think is very important. And that is in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, there was some big changes in bank regulation known as Basel III. It was uh, mm -hmm. passed in 2010 and phased in through 2019. So it was decade long phase in. Before 2008, banks ran really close to the line because it maximized profitability. And anyone who didn't maximize right. profitability would get fired. So everybody did it. And what this meant is they didn't really have any cash. Uh, everything was like winging it on credit. Um, it's kind of like going out to have a big night in the town. And you've got $8 in your pocket and six credit cards. That, that was the typical American bank. Well, then if someone cuts off your credit cards and you've got to pay your rent, you're in trouble. Um, and that's in 2008, they all cut each other's credit cards, basically. Uh, and so the banks got together and said, well, we can't do this anymore. We have to hold high levels of cash. In fact, they, they, they look back at banking history. And for most of you look at 200, you know, two centuries of American banking history, banks typically had about 10% of assets in cash. Um, just standard conservative 1950s style banking practice. Uh, and they said, well, let's more or less adopt that model. And that's what they did. Well, that cash didn't exist. And, and for, for them to, to uh, meet those regulations, which were gradually phased in, someone had to make more cash, central banks, essentially. And when I say cash, I mean deposits at, at the central bank. Right. Um, and so uh, a lot of money was created after 2008. And, but the people all said, well, there's going to be tons of inflation because it looked like the money supply doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Uh, but a lot of that was absorbed by banks due to their new regulations and it didn't really have that much effect. There was actually some inflationary effect, but it wasn't that much. Um, and if you, you can even see how much they need, they have, they, JP Morgan has a little section in his annual report says, you know, this is how much cash we have to hold according to these new regulations. And so you can see how much they need. And so that has to exist. So the, the point of all this is, is people aren't really aware of this. Uh, they see that central banks created a ton of money and bought government bonds in the process of essentially financing the government. And it didn't seem like there was much inflationary effect. Well, can't we just keep doing that? Didn't we prove we can do that? Well, the problem is that regulation has now been phased in. Banks are now completely topped up. Uh, and and he, they even actually, if you remember, at, at the end of 2019, there was actually uh, a, a minor liquidity crisis then because banks were facing this full phase in of the regulations and they, the, the amount of cash they needed literally did not exist. And uh, there were some problems then. And one of the reasons I think that the Federal Reserve created a lot of of money in the COVID crisis, March of 2020, is because not only were they kind of reacting to the economic downturn, but they had to make sure that banks could fully satisfy these new requirements in the midst of this crisis. Made sense. So that, that, again, that absorbed a lot of all that money creation. The problem is those tanks are full. There's nowhere else for the money to go that I can see. Right. So politicians look and they say, 2020, we spent three trillion dollars 15 percent of gdp the federal reserve bought the whole thing essentially it's what happened and that shit was fun let's do it again can we just do that didn't we prove that well i think if they try it again it's going to blow up in their face and of course they're going to try it again so that's kind of where we stand today and they made up this little story money modern monetary theory to justify it and i think that's where we stand today i think it is actually quite dangerous because what we tend to see in these situations is that if they if they tried it again, um, let's say money supply, basically base money of the central bank, central central bank balance sheet expanded 20%. Well, you might say, well, 20% more supply, maybe the currency value will drop 20%, kind of mathematically ratio. Mm -hmm. But what actually tends to happen is people market sees this and they say, okay, these guys are nuts. I'm out of here. And the currency drops 80%. <laughs> Uh, and I'm joking, you know, for example, in the early 1970s, 
there was actually not very much money creation in the early 1970s, but the, the value of the current of the dollar between 1969 and 1974 actually fell about roughly about 80%. So this does happen. This has happened to us before. And that is what I can see happening if they tried this one more time and we kind of have a recession coming up and aren't to kind of try it. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch that happen. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, part of that plays into politics. Uh, we have uh, coming up in November elections, midterm cycle. Uh, and, you know, any president, unfortunately, is not thinking more longer term uh, for the good of the country. They're thinking about or their parties thinking for them how they could be reelected. And that, that applies to both sides. I'm not singling out one. Uh, and that applies to CEOs of public companies that have to answer to quarterly reports. And this is a big problem, but we could save that one for a different time. I say, and is it a little overkill? Inflation effectively is government theft of our money. Uh, yeah, these are these are kind of slogans. Um, and they can be helpful on, on, on the level of slogans, but I think it's, you know, technically, if you think of it as a decline in the value of the currency, um, which may arise from government making more of it to pay bills. Yes. <laughs> or it may, it may arise also just from kind of mismanagement without any kind of monetary expansion. Uh, for example, you brought up 1933. There actually was no money creation in 1933. They just kind of did it because if the if Roosevelt said we want the dollar value to go down, it's about 40%. We want the value dollar's value to go down 40%. Are you going to stick around? <laughs> like, of course, you're out. You're out of there, right? So yeah, the demand yeah. fall, and they actually didn't have to create any money to get the, to achieve their goal, uh, strangely enough. So those so things like that happen. Um, if, if, if technically, if you think of it in that way, now, now we are getting what you're kind of get, what you're kind of alluding to. If you look at the history of currency debasement, currency depreciation, it's very old. Uh, the, the very first coins. Uh, ever created in the seventh century BC were actually uh, did not contain the precious metals indicated by their face value. So people used to trade and just press, they, they would just weigh gold, they just weigh silver and they would make payments. But you say, well, we have a coin, so you don't have to weigh things anymore. Would you, you just hand over a coin, but the coin didn't actually contain the silver. It was stamped on the thing. Uh, so the very first coinage was, was actually a, a case of currency devaluation. Um, so this has been around a long time. And I'm sorry, Nathan, please. Yes. Um, and but the, what we had, and it was mostly done essentially for government finance. So it's kind of similar to taxes, you could say in that way. But we had something very different in the 20th century. We got into, we weren't really financing the government. We were engaging in macroeconomic manipulation. We were printing money or juggling interest rates or changing the value of the currency to solve unemployment, to make the bond market do this or that or the other, to change investment patterns. We weren't really financing the government. And now, but we're now, I, th I think around the world, we're getting back to that original model of financing the government. And that is when you can go from inflation, kind of this long, you know, this single digit or maybe low double digit kind of annoying cancer. <laughs> On the economy to just kind of outright disaster. Um, when you get into the government print money to fund the government cycle, uh, that is when you can just go completely. And we've kerfluid. seen that happen. You can mention what Zimbabwe, the German Weimar mark, uh, the in Argentina. I mean, it's it's happened before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it's hard to imagine it happening here in the US to the dollar, but again, thinking of worst case scenarios, and then that begs the question, I think you define it from a quote in your book, what defines hyperinflation? It's a pretty significant number. What is it like 50% a month of like uh, of inflation increasing? Well, there's a little bit of debate about that. We don't have a lot of words to describe different gradients of inflation. Um, there is actually a definition uh, from the International uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board and which is adopted also by the U.S. financial accounting standards, because there have been big corporations like Coca-Cola, like McDonald's, like Exxon that operate in hyperinflationary jurisdictions. And they say, well, how do we do the counting? And so they made some guidelines. And they basically define hyperinflation as a situation where typically CPI rises 100% in or more in three years. So it's an annual rate of about 28% per year, which probably doesn't sound very hyper. That's not really, you know, hyper. It's not like you're cup of coffee doubles in price while you're drinking it. 
Um, but if you think about it, if you have 28% official CPI reading out of the government, that's when the financial system goes kerflu. You can no longer you know, borrow and lend and have any kind of long-term uh, contract when you've got that kind of uncertainty of pricing and currency value. And that's so, it, so if things break, right? Like you're, you're kind oh, of just, chaos. you kind of, you kind of go mm-hmm. hand to mouth and it's very common. All of Latin America had hyperinflation in the eighties, all of Eastern Europe had hyperinflation in the nineties. Right. It's very common. Um, and what typically it, we, we also think of hyperinflation as a change in a political process. We, we go, and which I just described, we go from macroeconomic manipulation while we're trying to get the unemployment down rate down or whatever uh, to just, you know, printing bills to pay the soldiers. Um, and they don't really, and uh, people say, well, how do you get into hyperinflation? Well, we, we actually mentioned the example of, of Weimar Germany. They were funding 60% of the government with a printing press because typically tax revenues collapse because you got this tax system where you, uh, you know, you make the money in January and you pay the next April. Well, next April, money's not worth anything. So you give them, you give them what you're, you, give, you pay the taxes, but it's, you know, like 27 cents. And so the, so the real value of tax revenues collapse. And then what are they going to do? Well, they're either going to, you know, print the money or they're going to, their government's going to shut down, like literally shut down like 24 hours. Um, so that, that is how governments get into these situations. And it goes on until they decide not to. It's just, it's a political process. Uh, some round robin questions. Actually, some of these I relatively recently asked uh, Rick Rule, speaking of gold. Uh, you'll probably get a chuckle out of the first one and say they don't use it anyway, but I'm still going to ask it. Is gold a tool for the central bankers? Uh, is gold a tool for the central bank? I'm not quite sure what that uh, that phrase is supposed to get at, but I do think that there does seem to be a persistent and systematized uh, process of trying to keep the dollar from falling versus gold, versus gold, supporting the value of the dollar versus gold, essentially, or suppressing the gold price, if you want to put it in those terms. And although central bankers talk like gold is a pet rock and useful for making earrings, uh, they still own a lot of it, don't they? And I can tell you, I can tell you, uh, from personal experience, personal context, that certainly in the 80s and 90s, Paul Volcker, Alan Greenspan kept a close eye on the value of the dollar versus gold. Uh, Volcker was a child of Bretton Woods. Volcker grew up in the gold standard era, and Alan Greenspan was a gold standard advocate when, in his youth. And they kept, they wanted to keep the dollar from, from declining dramatically versus gold. And, the, and that has continued to some extent since then. So in that sense, yes, I, I think that the gold market is, if you want to call it manipulated, right. comes under influence to keep these currencies from falling in value more than they have because they have fallen. So yes, and in that sense, yeah, a tool. You could say it's a tool. Yes. Does gold cause or contribute to war? Does gold? Um, well, historically, yes, because it's easy to steal. <laughs> if you look at the history of yes. Roman conquest, Alexander 100%. the Great. Alexander, you know, went into Persia with his army and the Persian government is very big government and they had a ton of gold and silver and he stole it <laughs> and paid his and paid his armies with that gold. Uh, so Which they gladly it, accepted. It has it has a long history of that. And the United States government stole the gold that was in Iraq when they went in there. And it was a lot. I think they don't talk about it that much um, today. I don't think it's that much of a motivation. Well, although I, I brought up Libya, it can it can be a, a motivation in that sense. Uh, I mean, if you want to be in a prediction business, it always makes good interviews. What do you think the price of gold will be by the end of the year? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I adhere to uh, the gold is money theory that the price, the value of gold is actually pretty stable, and, and the price of gold is really just the floating fiat dollar compared to something that's pretty stable in value. So it's essentially when you say what's the price of gold, you're saying what's the value of the dollar going to be. Um, by the end of the year, I think you know the Federal Reserve is kind of holding the line. They don't want the value of the dollar to sink uh, for now, and so they, I think they w- would want to keep the dollar from making new high, new lows versus gold or new highs in in the gold price. Uh, so I think maybe it'll be pretty stagnant for the rest of the year. Uh, the 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 caveat is if we are in a pretty bad recession or the you know, stock market, S&P 500 is down 47%, something like that. 
there's some financial companies that come into difficulties, then they might have to throw it out the window and you're going to get the Fed put (laughs) and uh, this kind of thing, which historically has been very gold positive. A true uh, with inflation so high now, can the Fed keep on raising interest rates? Uh, It's an interesting question because we don't really have the interest rate system that we had before 2008. Um, Now, that was the Fed fund rate. The Fed fund rate is the rate that banks lend to each other because I just mentioned they used to lend to each other all the time because they didn't have any cash. Well, they threw that out. The banks threw that out. They said, we're not going to rely on borrowing from other banks. That market's gone, Um, the interbank market, essentially. It declined 97% or something. and the Fed is no longer active in it. We now have something else, the interest on overnight reserves, which was <laughs> implemented in 2008. And we don't really have much experience with this thing. We t- kind of fooled around with it in 2018 and had to back off very quickly. So uh, this is something that uh, is not talked about very much. And the Fed doesn't really know like, what is our policy now? Does this, in, you know, if we go... Because essentially, it's it's kind of artificial. It, well, it's an interesting question. The interest rate on overnight reserves is something that was invented in 2008. It didn't exist before. In other words, it was zero. It was nothing. So that was Federal Reserve policy from 1913 to 2008, 0%. So if we had 0% today, isn't that normal? So this, I think we're getting into this like very weird situation where right. things might not work out the way people think they will. <laughs> might be, essentially, it might be much more negative than people think. Now, my audience is a pretty hardcore investing audience, so I'm going to transition a couple of questions to inflation and investing. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, let me know, Nathan. I've never quite brought in and the statistics I've seen, well, gold or anything, but let's pick on gold a little bit. Gold is always, I did use that word always, gold is always an inflation hedge. Oh, really? I mean, I believe in parts of the 70s it was. It's, I mean, how about oil? How about timber? There may be, other, if, if I'm in Argentina when they had their problems, the US dollar would be a fantastic inflation hedge. In other words, no one thing is always really an inflation hedge. Uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's good to understand what people mean, gold fans, let's say, sophisticated gold investors mean, when they say it's inflation hedge. Well, think of it as a currency. Think of it, think of gold as a currency which has a special property. It doesn't go up and down in value very much. Uh, and so if the US dollar goes down in value and gold doesn't go down in value, then obviously the price of gold in dollars will go up. And that would that's your inflation hedge, right? You can hold, own gold and not get devalued along with all the other dollar holders. And that has nothing really to do with the CPI directly consumer price index. CPI will rise as a consequence of that, but that could be months and even years down the road. So people, you know, today people say, oh, you know, CPI is 8%, but gold is, hasn't moved in 12 months. Well, yeah, you got your inflation hedge back in 2019, 2020, when gold went from 1200 to, to 1900, approximately. That was the inflation hedge. Um, now, another thing is in the 1970s, uh, there were a lot of other commodities that went up in nominal value oil especially, but also wheat and many other things. But they didn't go up nearly as much as gold. Or to put it in slightly different terms, they went down in real value. Uh, Now, we began that period in the 1960s. We had very high commodity prices in the 1960s. Uh, The value of wheat, copper, so forth, not so much oil, but other things, was much, much higher than it is today. And so the effect of... uh, And during the 70s, the the nominal price went up, but the real value went down a lot. Or in, in other words, gold outperformed by multiples. Um, everything else. Uh, now that's very different because in, in 2020, in 2019, before 2020, we had really some of the lowest commodity prices values. I would say I compare commodity values to gold, uh, and those ratios were among the lowest in history. Actually, they were the lowest in history. Yes. And then we had 2020. On top of that, we had this COVID demand collapse. And then so we were at the lowest levels in history. And then we went and fell off the cliff, another 40%, or oil, like went into negative numbers. So we, we entered into this inflationary situation with like just insanely low commodity prices. And now commodities uh, have been radically outperforming oil. They've been, they've been kind of sure. bouncing up in real value. Um, 
and while also adjusting, while also having this inflationary uh, advantage. So I, and I think it looks like that's going to continue. It looks like to me, you know, that we could see another doubling of the real value. I mean, doubling is quite a lot, but significant rise in the real value of, of commodities. So it's somewhat, it's a somewhat different situation. Um, and they also have commodity producers pay big dividends and they have other attractive features. So they've been a better, a better, if you want to call it an inflation hedge or just a better, straight a better investment than gold in the recent years, certainly. Well, then if we're trending towards high inflation already, higher inflation expected, a recession, possibly a depression, it's like lots of bad things. If you're a significant family of wealth and resources, and you've been in the industry, including in the hedge fund world for a long time, I don't know if I'd use the word, where do you hide, but where do you invest? So again, we could do an hour or two on this alone, but relatively in a couple of minutes. So you mentioned generally pretty positive on commodities. Uh, do you agree with Ray Dalio's statement uh, recently on a, a popular show that cash is trash? How do you broadly feel about bonds, about stocks? I think we got a little bit of your opinion about Bitcoin, but always willing to hear a little more. And how about other real uh, quote unquote physical assets like real estate? Uh, unfortunately, we, we've come into the recent period with very high asset values across the board, valuations, I should yes. say. And so it's hard to find a place to hide. Uh, the the commodity producing sectors, particularly the energy sector, has been fantastic. I think it's got a long way to go. I mean, the funny thing we've seen is is the price of stocks goes up and the valuation goes down. And now energy producers are, you know, they're. I, I was recently I purchased, I recently bought some Total Energy, which is a giant, you know, hundred billion plus company. It's you know global blue chip at four times earnings. Like, what is wow. this? When does that? You know, when does that ever happen? Right, it's not some like little Canadian venture operation, right? Um, so there's some there remains some interesting opportunities there. Uh, people, you know, Bill Gates owns some farmland. There's probably a good reason for that, although it's kind of a well-known idea now. It, but it's it's a problem. Almost everything tends to have very high valuations, even now, and it's very easy. You know, if if we do have substantial inflation, substantial declines in currency value, that's the, you know, it's just going to get smoked. Not only in terms of, you know, if you, if something has a nominal price tag of a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. but your dollar is only worth 20% of what it used to be worth. Well, he just got killed for 80%, right? Oh, but, sure. but what happened, but what happens is, is not only that, but that hundred dollars is based on a very high valuation and then the valuation gets killed. So it actually goes from a hundred to fifty hundred dollars to $50 while the value of the currency goes down 80%. And Correct. that is just, absolutely murderous. Uh, so unfortunately, it's very easy to imagine how, how that could take place. Um, you know, if the bond market falls apart and we have 8 10% interest rates, that, <laughs> that would be extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, other than, than commodities, which you sound, uh, I would border on, say, very bullish on, at least in the short term, back to Ray Dalio's comment recently that cash is trash. And on the surface, you know, you could definitely make that argument. If inflation is seven, eight, nine, ten percent, your return on quote unquote long-term government treasuries and cash is a hell of a lot less than that. So I could say you're losing what six, seven, eight percent a year. But the converse of that is potentially certain real estate, equities, uh, more aggressive bonds. I may be losing 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. I may be happy to only lose six or seven percent. What a sad world that is. But it does make me wonder whether Dalio is so accurate in that comment after all. Well, you know, if, if we if we knew the future exactly, we would just buy the best performing asset. <laughs> uh, but we don't know the future. When you exactly. figure that out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so so cash so cash is nice because you know it's something you can, it's a tool you can use to deal with changing situation. But yes. I'd, I'd also point out, I just mentioned that in the 1970s, my estimate is that the value of the dollar fell by 90%. You got slapped for 90% on your dollar bills. on your, you know. But it was actually one of the best performing assets of the decade, just as you sort of mentioned. Um, and we started with lower valuations in the 60s than we had today. Uh, for one thing, you're getting paid a lot on it. Uh, cash wasn't paying 0% or 2%. It was paying 7, 8, 9, 10, 13%. Um, and every time the Fed hiked rates, 
the bond market got got killed, stock market got killed, and the cash guys got paid more. <laughs> so, yes. so uh, oddly enough, even though cash, you know, hypothetically lost ninety percent during the decade, it was one of the best performing assets. And I, so I, <laughs> I, I, so I, I, I uh, support. I have, you know, personally, and, and I support fairly large cash holdings, um, uh, essentially for, for that reason, even, even expecting you know, inflationary situation. Uh, so, so I, so I, let's just put it there. Would you recommend that families of great wealth invest in broadly in hedge funds? And I'm going to emphasize the word hedge fund uh, <laughs> meeting, but the reality is, I mean, I'm based in Greenwich and I've interviewed many of them and many of them have been on my platform before. Ray Dalio has spoken, Tudor Jones, uh, David Einhorn, Bill Ackman. Brilliant. I love to hear them. They have some great years, some okay years and some bad years. And in the unique markets that we're in now, like you said, really, is there any place to hide? And by being good at hedging and potentially shorting, I mean, really, how many managers, hedge fund managers consistently are really good at that? Nathan, I might be wrong. I don't think it's a lot of them. Well, I, I, um, um, I tend to agree. You know, there, there are great managers. Uh, I think you need to be a hedge fund manager, which I've, I've been in a very minor way, but I've played the game. Um, I, you have to be a good hedge fund manager to identify a good hedge fund manager, <laughs> uh, which is kind of like that one, which kind of, which kind of raised the bar, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, there were hedge funds in the 60s and well, and, and almost all of them got killed. But there were some that were just phenomenally good in the 70s. You know, George Soros, him and, and Jim, Jim Rogers, it was two of them in a little like rental office with the secretary, and they made 40 times their money in that decade. Pretty good. <laughs> if you could find those guys, great. Uh, you know, people, people have environments where that just clicks with them. I, I completely flubbed the tech bubble. Um, over the, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, it just wasn't, you know, paying nosebleed valuations for the silly stuff just made my skin crawl. I couldn't do it. Uh, but those tiger guys did great. And now, and now, now I'm in an environment where I do very well and those tiger guys are getting murdered. And I guess T that's tiger global point. I'm referring to very, very large hedge fund. Of course, so it, about know, diversification, even, even a great manager just has an environment that clicks with them and environment that they're just, you know, always on the wrong foot and it's very hard, but good luck. <laughs> there, are, there are great managers out there. Uh, finding There them. are, but part uh, of the problem that they have is a lot of them eventually end up getting what, 10, 20, 30 billion of AUM. They're placating to institutional investors that want low volatility, are probably happy getting quasi consistently six or 7% returns. And depending on the market, sometimes that could actually look pretty good, uh, but they're too big. It's hard for them to be nuanced and have more intimate plays with their analysts that they decide to move on, really move the needle. They become too big and they effectively become asset gatherers. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, there's interesting hedge fund statistics these days. And one of the most extraordinary elements of, of the statistics is smaller is better when it comes to hedge funds. Uh, the, the cap weighted, the difference between the equal weighted index, in, which obviously skews towards smaller funds, and the cap weighted index, which skews towards larger funds, it's mm -hmm. like six to ten percent a year. <laughs> wow, that's huge. outperformance of the small guys compared to the big guys because of those factors that you say. So, uh, you know, uh, you have to be selective because anyone can call themselves a hedge fund manager. Um, but uh, look for the small guys. Not even small it doesn't have to be five million, but you know, under a billion. Uh, look for the smaller managers because they probably are able to act on their insight. They haven't become institutionalized. They're not, you know, too scared, to, too scared of losing. Perhaps two final questions. Can the Fed reduce demand without breaking the back of the economy? By the way, that was a question that Sorkin asked Dalio in his cash ish trash a couple of days ago. Thought it was a good question. <laughs> uh, we actually have, yeah, we have a section in the book, in the book Inflation about this. Uh, so what is the theory? What is, what is the theory there? Well, we just said, we have supply demand issues like oil or fertilizer or used cars or go down the list. We have these supply demand issues. Well, isn't the solution to that more supply? Isn't the solution to that unblocking all these supply chain issues and getting the auto factories running? And obviously, yes, 
we have monetary issues. Uh, we created a lot of money in 2020 and we have some inflationary consequences of that. And the Fed has actually been pretty responsible of at least keeping it from getting any worse, I think. Uh, what does blowing up the economy with high unemployment have to do with anything of that? <laughs> you know, so so the, the, theory, the theory basically is, well, we don't have that much supply and we have a lot of demand, baby formula, whatever. So that drives prices up, right? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Well, if we have more unemployment, then people are not going to have a job and not going to have any money so they can't buy the stuff. <laughs> so the, the fact that the shelves are empty is not going to matter, right? That's basically the theory. <laughs> it, it's, it's extremely stupid, but economists are extremely stupid, as you probably noticed. And <laughs> so, so one of the things we want to get into in the book, and, and, this was, and this is kind of like the, we well, need to break the back of inflation theory that sort of led to the 1982 recession. I even talked about this in my first book from 2007. Um, just fix the problem, right? Uh, take yes. care of the supply chain issues. At the very least, try to keep the dollar from falling in value anymore, even if this means you know, telling Congress, go take a hike when they want you to finance their next Green New Deal nonsense. Uh, that is how you fix the problem. Um, you don't have to create a recession. <laughs> I mean, aren't those two good things, like stable value of the currency, functioning economy, two good things. Economy should get better, not worse. And before I give you a chance to talk a little bit about the book and the closing comment, taking us back to where we got in our troubled zone about an hour ago, so I can't help to end that way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, does the World Economic Forum and those powers that be want us to live in a world where we don't own anything? Uh, but that's what they said. <laughs> That's what uh, they said. Means, yeah, yes. apparently. Well, you know, world where we own nothing is the world where they own everything. And that's basically, you know, Soviet communism was the first version of that. Of course. And so, they take care of you. You'll get government subsidized housing. You'll get food to eat, which makes me think, are things so bad where Gen Z and younger millennials actually want that security blanket? They'll never be good. They'll never be great. But they maybe won't be whatever the bottom 5%. I mean, really? Do people really want that? I mean, maybe I'm totally disconnected from the world. I don't know. Yeah, that, you know, that's interesting. I, I asked as general Gen X myself, are these younger generations, do they just have like some completely different mental space than we do? Where they've just been bred to be, I don't know, socialists, worker bees or something? <laughs> Or, or, or are they, you know, are they kind of like fundamentally like we are, but they just need good leadership or something like that? Um, that's an interesting question. I, 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 I don't know where that's going. Um, one thing I, I will mention, though, which I was thinking about when we were earlier today, uh, was that it always seems to be an option. Like we weren't forced to take the COVID vax. We had the option to, right? We, and even though there might be a lot of incentives that are put up, I think that if this kind of, you know, uh, a World Economic Forum Davos Agenda 2030 program does get implemented to some degree, there will be an option. You might have to give up things, you might have to make compromises, but you will have be able to drop out. Hmm. Yeah, that does make me wonder, are we living in the matrix after all, if not <laughs> literally, perhaps figuratively? It'll be interesting times, but interesting times makes for, well, interesting times. We shall see. Uh, Nathan, it's been great to have you on. Uh, for those that would like to, I'm assuming, at Amazon, again, it's the book is Inflation, What It Is, Why It's Bad, and How to Fix It, co-authored with Steve Forbes himself and Elizabeth Ames. Uh, how else could my audience be more familiar with your work? Do you do any consulting? Do you have any other... Uh, things you do that maybe family offices could engage with in different ways than just, and I do recommend buying your book. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have four other books. And if you have an interest in economic topics and certainly monetary topics, uh, they're available at my website, newworldeconomics.com, which is, which is economics theory related, macro related. It's not really about investing, um, but they're available there and you can buy them at Amazon as well. Um, it kind of comes from the supply side. I'm, I'm basically come from the soft supply side circle of the Jack Kemp, Art Laffer, sure. Forbes uh, circle kind of represent the younger generation of that. So that's kind of where that comes from. Um, in terms of investing stuff, people always ask me, well, where do I put my money? And I, I decided to actually, I was doing a little work for an institutional investor, big, big fund manager. Um, he, he asked me, does, 
write him a write him a letter, uh, you know, my opinions. Uh, and that actually grew into a retail newsletter, which is on Substack, uh, which the links are at newworldeconomics.com. It's called the Polaris Letter, and it's real cheap. And you can and, and it's it's aimed for the typical retail investor, typical, you know, 401k. Uh, upper middle class kind of person, but actually, you know, family offices and, and large institutional groups have more or less the same concerns. So I think it would be useful. And uh, if you are interested in more of an institutional grade opinion, uh, I don't really have, hang out a shingle. I don't have an official business or an office, but I do have a few people that I keep in touch with uh, that are in the institutions uh, and run billions of dollars. So you could just send me an email and maybe we'll put you on the email list. And would your email be on the website that you referenced or in yep. Substack? Yeah, it's there. So it's at newworldeconomics.com. Nathan at newworldeconomics.com is the public email. Well, great. This has been fantastic, Nathan. I probably still had about 20 questions we had to leave on the cutting room floor. I would definitely like to have you back later in the year, perhaps in December. Uh, yeah, nothing like having back to back. I'll have you, Harry Dent. Peter Schiff and Mark Faber. How about that? Like that, that'd be like my whole week, maybe to wrap up the year. <laughs> That's a great that list. Be, I love those and guys. I'll throw John Molded in there too. So we'll we'll have really a love fest together. Uh, David Hunter, why not? So now I have six that I know. Uh, we'll do two in one day to kind of make up for that five day week. Uh, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. A founder of Family Office Association. You can check us out at Family Office on YouTube. I'm active on Instagram, although more personal, Angelo Robles Meta, as in Metaverse. Uh, keep active social media profiles and check out my company, which is FamilyOfficeAssociation.com. Uh, we're an organization dedicated to highly successful investors and families that want peer to peer connectivity and access to special resources familyofficeassociation.com. We hope you all enjoyed it. Again, a special thank you to Nathan Lewis for being a great guest and look forward to the next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.